All right. Well, w welcome to everyone. And thank you, Alison and Matty, so much for allowing the Islamic Arts Circle to, to co-host this. Um, I'll just introduce Ina um, Sarekhani Sandman and Sandman and Oliver, and then um, Ina will take over from me and then Oliver will continue and give his presentation. And then all questions just write in the chat box, please. Um, and then Alison will um, do the question answer, you know, answer some of the, or Oliver will, uh, or Ina will answer the questions at the end and um, Alison will direct them. So um, I'm sure most people know Ina, but um, already, but she's co-founder and director of the Sarikhani collection, a body of some th thousand works of art from Iran, housed in its own private museum. In addition to managing the museum's curatorial activities, Ina and the collection promote research in the culture and arts of Iran, including loans, exhibitions, research projects, publications and philanthropy, including supporting academic posts. And here, when we're here tonight, as you all know, to um, celebrate the launch of Oliver's wonderful um, volume on the uh, Islamic pottery. Um, Ina is passionate about culture and convinced of the importance and benefit of collaborative projects and has developed close relationships with partner institutions, both museums and universities in Britain, Europe and the US. Beyond roles within her own field, Ina is a founder member of the International Council of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and a visiting member of its Ancient Near Eastern Council, focusing on the redevelopment of its galleries. She is also chairman of the Sari Club, the think tank of the Islamic Museum in Berlin. She is currently co-curating two major exhibitions on, the art, on art from Iran. Epic Iran, which opens in the VNA um, in February um, 2021. And then there's an exhibition planned um, at the James Simon Gallery on the Museum Island in Berlin for October 2021. Um, but perhaps, you know, we're hopefully, she's very kindly said that maybe once the collection is all together again, we'll be able to organise sort of society visits to the museum itself, which is truly wonderful. Um, Ina studied at Cambridge, SOAS and the Courtauld Institute, and so has a very good rounded background in the art of her um, heritage. heritage. Um, I don't think Oliver really needs much um, introduction. I'm sure ev almost everyone must know him. Um, he completed his PhD on Persian tile work at SAS in 1977 and shortly afterwards joined the Department of Ceramics at the VNA, where he specialised in Islamic art, particularly pottery, and in contemporary student pottery. Oh, sorry, studio pottery. <laughs> Slight slip there. Um, he left the VNA in 2003 to help build the new, the new Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, returning there as director in 2008 after a brief stint at the Ashmolean in Oxford. In 2011, he joined the University of Oxford as the first IMPE Professor of Islamic Art and Architecture and retired in 2016. His specialisms include Islamic pottery, particularly of the early and medieval period, the history of collecting Islamic art and issues of fakes and forgeries in contemporary British studio pottery. Um, I'm sure everyone knows all his major publications, so I think probably just to get everything moving, let's carry on to Ina, um, who will then sort of give a more lengthy introduction to the collection and Oliver's contribution, amazing contribution. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Rosalind, and thank you both to the Royal Asiatic Society and to you and your Islamic Art Circle for welcoming us here today. And actually, in a normal course of events, today is the official launch day of Oliver's book. So we would have been hosting you in somewhere more illustrious surroundings and proffering you with champagne to make sure that you really love the book. Um, but as it is, we'll just have to rely on Oliver to make sure you love it, and I'm sure he'll succeed. Um, Rosalind's asked me to give a little background on our collection uh, and then talk um, about uh, how we got together and and I, having looked at the guest list today I think 
everyone knows, but uh, but for those who don't, I'll just uh, do a little brief precy. So my father is from Iran and he was a student here in London uh, at the tail end of the 60s when he met my mother um, and they finished their studies and got married here. We, I was born here and then they went back to Iran um, and then we left like so many people did. I was a very young child um, in, in a rather a hurry as the political escalations of the 70s blew up and we came to England uh, literally with two suitcases. Um, my father had no papers and neither did most of us children um, and we were UN refugees for eight years and um, it was a uh, it was it was a tough and challenging time and thankfully and for those of you who know my parents will know I always want to make sure that I thank them first and foremost for being such amazing role models the warmth of my mother and the brilliance of my father meaning that we could pull up our socks and have a very wonderful life and then having had that kind of wonderful immigrant drive and and success there was a moment in our lives sort of at the turn of millennium where we sort of stood up and we had a bit of a family tragedy and we stood up and we took notice of what we were doing and really um, made us think about what it meant to live well and what it meant to live authentically, this wonderful sort of millennial word, you know. Um, and one of the things we all felt, including my German mother, that we missed was this connection with Iran, uh, which was a familial connection as much as a, a national connection because my grandmother's family had been artists and artisans for hundreds of years. And uh, we started looking at art, we started going to museums, uh, we started talking to people, started talking to even contemporary artists. And we have ended up doing something which we absolutely never ever meant to do, <laughs> like an insane idea, which was that we started um, uh, buying objects and my father and I were quite intense and mac and soon the sort of 10 objects became 100 and we now have nearly a thousand objects as Rosalind mentioned um, and then having had these objects and having had them in storage we thought well this is really unsatisfying why don't we do something where we can really make sure that it's first of all seen and then being seen you know can become a resource and so we built a small private museum and many of you have been there and I hope will come again you know when when the dust settles from this horrible pandemic that we're going through um, and from the beginning we've been very very keen to make sure that people realize that we wanted to be useful and helpful and resourceful and so um, from the early days of doing little loans and you know sort of philanthropic support here and there we have really tried very hard to build up a um, a Kind of a public program of you so you know we support academic positions and you know lend where we can support exhibitions we have now started initiating research projects and one that oliver is involved with i can see him in the corner um with the ashmolean um as well as becoming involved and uh, in exhibitions in a, in a more major more major way and along the line uh, there were lots of teachers including many of you again here in fact Melanie Gibson's uh, I saw her on the list and she was the person who first came to catalogue um, um, our ceramics for us when, while she was completing her PhD and um, and is now of course a legend and has her own publishing empire so that's great so what we wanted to do was think about um, about publishing and, and books are something that in this digital age still have a profound use there is something about looking at objects in a book which is very different to looking at them on a screen and I think a well-published book allows you to appreciate the materiality of the objects you can get a sense of what feel like in your hand and I think in the context of Iranian art I've always felt that this was a really important aspect that it was you know that this is art on a small scale it's intimate it's it's that it's still the big themes you know it's still war and love and God and spirituality you know the fear of the unknown you know the divine um, but it's often in a small scale and it's that handling of the plate or the bowl or the object the turning of it in the light that reveal something to you about what you are looking for or seeking or that profound personal moment. And when we were th talking about starting a project of doing a book on ceramics, it was very important to me that it 
conveyed that aesthetic quality that by looking through the book you could get a sense of texture of weight um, the coolness the smoothness and that was really really important to me but the other thing that that's always been key to us is to do something that's academically new and um, so when we approached Oliver to do this book we were obviously so thrilled that the god of Islamic ceramics even sort of sat around the table and considered us as a kind of a, a competent partner with him but we really thought about what we could do to push the boundary and Oliver had the absolute genius idea of approaching Mijan Matan who was who had been a student of his and who uh, who I think forensic archaeologist Oliver correct me if that's or Mujang, correct me if that's the correct word but someone who not only had language skills uh, and aesthetic skills but also scientific analysis um, as a set of school and Mujan has translated the two uh, medieval, the known medieval texts in a profoundly important way. So the ones by Abu al-Qasim Kashani and Johari Nishapuri. And we have in the book, of course, these two texts in parallel. I'm sure that Oliver will say something more about that. Um, and Mujan's also provided a commentary on these texts, which are really fascinating and really get a sense of that wonderful alchemaic quality of taking mud and making objects of great inventiveness and skill. And the other thing that was important to us as Persian speakers and with this kind of tradition of poetry and literature was that all the inscriptions on the objects were translated and Will Kwiatowski has done a beautiful job of translating them. Anyone who's had a flick of the book will see uh, there's lines of Hafiz or from the Quran or from wherever that, that really give another layer to, to the materiality of those objects. So this is our first book with Yale. So I do want to thank the team at Yale. Um, it's been an absolutely fantastic experience working alongside them and uh, you know the team of Mark and Miranda um, has been brilliant at bringing together Oliver's work. But most of all, I want to thank Oliver for being such a fantastic person to work with. I've, I think I wrote in the forward, I've enjoyed every minute and I really have. It's been a, a wonderful learning curve for us um, and a great start to our publication cycle. And with that, Oliver, I think I'll hand over to you. Right, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I would like to stress though that the book is, a, is a, a team effort. And although I've contributed, I think more words than anybody else, there has been enormous contribution. Uh, I'd first, of course, like to thank Ali Sarihani, who was the person who first uh, approached me um, about uh, writing a book on this collection. Uh, Ina has been the driving force of keeping us all together, and the, what the book finally ends up like is very uh, much due to her interest. Uh, I don't know if everybody has actually seen a copy of the book. It is very impressive. It is large, it is 500 and something pages, um, 240 objects, it's beautifully designed, it's very heavy, it's not exactly bedtime, re bedtime reading. Um, and my fellow authors in particular, uh, Mujan and Will, who have uh, together I think turned this into, into a book I hope of some real substance. Um, the idea, I think, is that I'm now going to run through uh, a brief presentation um, and with Ina, and Ina, one of Ina's jobs is to make sure it doesn't turn too much into a, a, a long lecture. Um, and I need to bring up my uh, PowerPoint to do that. And then after that, there might be more discussion and we will, we will take some, some questions. What I want to do in this Oh, now how do I? I want to share my screen. I think that's right, isn't it? Now, is that working for everybody? No. No. Is that no. great? Yeah. Yes. Right. So what I want to do in this presentation is to go through, um, show a number of the objects from the collection. I don't want to kind of precy the whole book, uh, but 
talk about some of the ideas that came up while um, while working working through it. Some of these ideas are um, well known to people who've been interested in Islamic pottery. I came started having new new things, new thoughts about this material. I was to begin with. Um, slightly nervous about whether one could actually disentangle Iranian pottery from Islamic pottery generally, because one of the great features of Islamic pottery right from the very beginning is the transmission of ideas. When I say transmission of ideas, these are actually ideas, techniques, styles taken by migrating potters right across the Islamic world from, uh, from starting and this is one of my, my newer ideas, that in fact fine glazed pottery starts in Egypt and Syria, not in Iraq, we'll come on to that a bit. Uh, but the idea of glazed pottery and the techniques for doing it are transported right across the Islamic world, so that by, certainly by the ninth century, everywhere from Spain to Central Asia is making glazed pottery and using the same basic technique. So can one disentangle Persian, uh, Iranian pottery from the rest? Well, in fact, I think you can because there are distinct traditions which arise in the eastern part of the Islamic world, which are quite distinct from things that happen to, uh, to the west. Now, one of the issues is that the art market is what supplies museums and collections with complete pieces, because Muslims don't bury objects with their dead. The finding of complete objects is both quite rare and um, of the sort of historical accidents pretty well. But we know most about where material comes from, from archaeological excavations. And the main archaeological excavations for our purposes here that have been published in any detail are really those from Samara and Siraf in uh, Mesopotamia in Iraq and from Nishapur in eastern Iran. We have a lot of much less um, scientifically based information on provenance from, from the art market. What is slightly sad in our studies is that there are a great number of excavations of seriously important sites that have been dug but not published in detail and these from uh, dating from the early period right through to the medieval and later periods, a whole range of sites which, if they were published, would transform our understanding of ceramics in this part of the world. And it is one of the great sadnesses of, of uh, as it were, our state in, in archaeology is that there are, there are these important collections which remain unpublished. Uh, and one only hopes that students in future will be turn towards these because there was plenty of PhD material right across all this. So essentially we know quite a lot and we have a lot of material from the eastern part of uh, Iran. I use, we use the definition as supplied by Wikipedia for greater Iran which as the boundaries of historic Iran have fluctuated so greatly, sometimes reaching as far as the Red Sea and the Mediterranean to the borders of China. Um, we essentially are concerned here with material from the Iranian plateau, so east of Iraq uh, into Central Asia. And we have a lot of material, know a lot about the 10th century in the eastern part. We know a lot about the medieval period based on the, particularly on the site of Kashan uh, in sort of central Iran, and we know something about later periods across the, across well, the, the current borders of, of Iran. But there are a lot of things we don't know. We don't, for instance, really know much about Western Iran before the 12th century or Eastern Iran after the 10th century, and there are many major uh, cities where we have no information at all. So although we've constructed a history as best we can, a kind of con cons uh, consistent um, history of the material we have, we can only expect that in years to come this will be quite considerably um, uh, changed by, by new studies. 
Now, we always start Islamic pottery with Samara in the 9th and 10th century, and these wares, which are some of the earliest uh, wares, uh, Islamic wares to be collected, um, have, I feel, rather dominated the dominating, because although the material is of great historic interest, this is in the uh, the homeland of the Abbasid Empire at its height, pottery made in new techniques with white glaze, inspired by imports from China, and then finding great um, commercial success, the lusterware, the, the piece here we see on the left with the, with the uh, soldier uh, depicted on it, a very sophisticated technique, and this ware gets exported, and we find it right the way across the Islamic world again from Spain to Central Asia and indeed further afield. But it's not actually, I believe, the beginning of fine Islamic pottery, and it's not even the finest Islamic pottery. Uh, I've written elsewhere about what I see as the development of fine glazed Islamic pottery happening in Syria and Egypt, and in this case, moving with migrating potters uh, eastwards into Iraq and then into uh, Iran and, and further on. But what interested me, sorry, I've somehow jumped back, is having time to look at, in close detail at a very good collection of very high quality pieces from uh, Eastern Iran, which are in the Sarahani collection. And what strikes me about this is that it is of the extraordinary high quality, both in its technical handling of the material and it, in its design um, input. And furthermore, that it owes absolutely nothing to China. And although a lot of writers still go on and try and see Chinese porcelain as the inspiration for the white background, I think that is, I, th I see no evidence for, the, for that at all, and that it is much more likely the, the idea that Julian Raby first um, presented to us that this is copying silverware with a uh, yellow decoration. They're very simple materials, red earthenware, a white slip on top, decoration in coloured slips, often in these epigraphic works uh, with black slip and then a thin lead glaze over the top. The calligraphy on these pieces, the quality of the design is quite extraordinary. Very wide variety of styles of painting in very high class, high skilled calligraphy, as good as you find on any other material pretty well of this period, as good as you find on coins and on most manuscripts. We still don't know quite how these calligraphers or these pottery decorators were trained, but their ability to place them on, on ceramics like this is really quite uh, extraordinary. That has always been recognized, I think, that these pieces are, are, are particularly uh, impressive. But I'd like to point out also how extraordinarily well made they are and that how the handling of the material is really quite breathtaking. This is a bowl, it's 45 centimetres in diameter. And I measured, I'm 45 centimetres pretty well across my shoulders. This is an enormous bowl. It is thrown very thinly in red clay in a way that is as good as any earthenware production across Asia and Europe until the 18th century. It is thrown in red clay, it is then left to dry and then the white slip has to be put on. The white slip is a dilute clay so the piece has to be made wet again. Before the, the slip goes on the piece has been turned to thin down the prof to sharpen the profile to thin down the walls cut the foot ring. It is then the white slip is applied that's a wet slip that then has to be dry. It's then handed to the decorator who has to draw the inscription on it in this uh, yet more coloured slip and sharpen up the decoration with a sharp tool to give it to make to make it precise. That is a lot of handling of a piece that is still unfired. A piece where if you took it by the ring you could easily break a fragment off between your thumb and finger. It then has to go yet again 
a covering in a liquid. The liquid glaze has to be applied over the top of this, and then it has to face the the you know the the, the dangers of the whole firing process. That is to me an extraordinary high level. This is ceramic making at the very top of its game. It is possible that this piece was biscuit fired, in other words, given a firing at some point before the glaze firing. But the sadness is that although we have reports across uh, Iran and Central Asia of the finding of ceramic workshops, not a single one has been published in any detail that we know, so that we know exactly what was made and how it was made there. One of the difficulties is that most of the workshops are in urban centers, uh, and so wastage material, which would have built up during processing in large quantities, which is presumably taken outside the town and dumped somewhere else. So it's not like kilns in China, for instance, where you have hundreds of tons of wastage material right next to the very kiln that, that made them. Um, that biscuit firing is a possibility, but we have as yet no evidence of it. And in parts of the world where firing material wood is in short supply that of course would have added both to cost um, and the extra handling in the whole the whole thing so really pretty extraordinary ceramic making we are often presented as a kind of sharp contrast to these fine epigraphic works of 10th century the eastern ten, uh, eastern iran and central asia in the 10th century with this particular ware, so-called buff ware from Nishapur, absolutely contrasting in its uh, impact, in its colour, in the, in the rather naive but very densely packed decoration. And there have been very interesting attempts in the past to relate this to ancient Iranians, you know, pre-Islamic uh, traditions and so forth, and the epigraphic works to more recent Arab and um, Muslim uh, uh, cultures. I think one has to add into that that actually this is quite clearly a derivation of a early Syrian ware which has come into eastern Iran with migrating potters in both its technology, the, the colours, the, the uh, lead tin yellow particularly, in bowl shape, in minor motifs. It has very close connection with things made earlier in uh, in Syria, so maybe the, um, we must be a bit cautious about constantly going back very far in time to, to discover uh, decorative motifs and, and meanings. But it also tends to give us the idea that, that pottery this time has this sharp distinction. You either have these very austere epigraphic works with Arabic inscriptions, or you have these very colourful, crowded patterns. It's not actually true. Those are at either end of a continuum of, of ceramic making and pattern making, in which there is a, you get every variety from, from the very austere to the highly decorative and coloured. And it was looking at pieces like this that made me think how very, very good these potters are. These are simple, more simple pieces, smaller than some of the biggest uh, epigraphic works. They are actually, interestingly enough, inspired initially by imported Iraqi lusterware in the design. But the quality of graphic invention and in originality here puts them into a class of their own, I, I would suggest. The wonderful way that these dynamic patterns with very simple abstracted shapes uh, turn, you know, fill the space, present a, a kind of dynamism and a movement in the design. And that if you place alongside these, the original, this is an Iraqi at the bottom here, an Iraqi luster bowl, which is quite of a type, which is quite clearly inspired these copies in much simpler technique. But how dull the painting is of the Iraqi Samara ware compared with this uh, these extraordinary designs. Now, I don't know if Yanga Ilyasov is with us uh, at this precise moment, but I want to thank him 
for another thing which I think is something really new which we've been able to add in this book and that is about where from Tashkent. Up until now we have known that the two major centres of production in the early period, the, the 9th, 10th century in the eastern part of the world are Nishapur and Samarkand and a lot of discussion is had about how you distinguish. This book even more pages than our book, they're not quite as heavy, uh, published a few years ago and uh, younger Ilyasov very kindly sent me a copy of it. This is a collect, uh, a book which concentrates on pieces found in the Tashkent oasis, either in excavations or in, in surveys there. He has already very convincingly argued that the famous plate here, the one at the top uh, from the Freer Gallery, is actually a Tashkent piece and neither Samarkand nor Nishapur. And going through this book, one sees a very wide range of materials, some of the very highest quality, some more simple things, and quite distinct local patterns, as it were, Tashkent styles emerging from it. And the interesting thing is that the Sarahani collection just happens to have a group of pieces, a few complete pieces and some very interesting shared material, some of which is known to have come from Tashkent and others which stylistically can be uh, attributed to it. And this is new material. So here are some things with the rather, this um, rather abstracted uh, calligraphy here and very typical uh, uh, other patterns that form a, a body of Tashkent work. Here are some Further pieces, still very dynamic design making on this bowl at the bottom um, with uh, these textured patterns in quite a sort of riotous way around the piece. The more disciplined epigraphic piece above with just repetition of a young, you know, good fortune round it. I calculated that this bowl the potter would have needed to put on over 2,000 little white dots, apart from all the other decorations. So this is quite meticulous work on quite a large piece. Again, this is 40, 40 centimetres or so, would have been 40 centimetres or so in diameter. Again, simple material, often quite simple patterns, but pottery making a very, very high order. And some of my favourite pieces, this little group of sherds showing different ways of doing birds. Uh, from uh, again from Tashkent, one fragment with a figure on and this adds to the very small group that we know of pieces slip decorated earthenware from the eastern part of the world which do have uh, human figures on. So much for the early period. When we come on to the medieval period we're again looking at some extraordinarily good, well-made, um, breathtaking pieces of breathtaking skill. Uh, I am, of course, always tempted to place the uh, better quality pieces in Kashan, which we know was the centre that had pretty well, as far as we can see, a monopoly on lustre production and enamel minai production. We'll look at those in a moment. But here again, the, the matter of handling this piece from the, from its from the start right through to the finished piece out of the kiln is quite extraordinary. This is a piece maybe just over 20 centimetres in diameter. The walls are only of two or three millimetres in thickness, um, including the glaze, but with a great depth of moulded decoration. This is taken from a mould and the background is also pierced. So pierced with little holes that the glaze then fills to, pro to provide transparencies. You can see from its condition that it's obviously a very fragile piece even when fired, but the state it must have, how fragile it must have been as it, as it was being made and taken through the kiln uh, is really makes it quite breathtaking. Now of course many of you will know the reason why Islamic pottery is often in not very good condition as we see here. Uh, the main reason being that the Muslims do not bury grave goods with their dead and therefore there aren't those great caches of perfect material that you find in China or you find earlier in, uh, in Greece and, and in other cultures. So 
a lot of the very best pieces are not necessarily in the very best condition. And uh, which we see here, but nevertheless, we have to use our imagination to see these as they would be when they come out of the kiln. Similarly here, a lovely jug of interest because it has the most detailed uh, set of fig signs of the zodiac as the main decoration and I think unique, certainly unique in ceramics with the, the name of the zodiac written above the, uh, the, uh, the, its representation. So in the center on the left here we have uh, Leo with the sun as its planet and its name Asad written above and on the right I think it's Aries. This again as the previous piece shows that the skill is not just in the potter making this but in the distinct trade of mold making so that the original of this was a very finely crafted uh, solid object from which production molds would have been taken. So it's a combination of particular skills that end up with pieces like this. Skills not always uh, paralleled. I always, this piece uh, intrigues me in that this is a very, very fine mold from which to produce this pot, but the potter who put it together uh, was less competent and given just rubbed the seam where the two halves of the mold down to smudging the design right the way down and then with a rather um, rather inept little mouth and, and, and handle which doesn't quite match match the piece but once you've got a mold you can go on making from it and is it where the mold maker maker is not in charge of the quality of, of the finished finished article just another piece to underline uh, that the best pieces aren't always in the best condition this again would have been a, a extraordinary piece 50 centimeters in diameter originally with these two enormous uh, figures, these lovers sitting side by side uh, uh, in, in originally in brilliant luster. I don't think uh, any piece of this, as it were, of this, of this quality survives complete. But pieces do survive complete and this is one in pretty well pristine condition as it would have come out of the kiln sometime in the late 12th century in Kashan with a wonderful piece of drawing in lusterware, seated figure very very elegantly holding his little fruit there and showing uh, show in full profile there. It's often thought you don't really get profile, full profiles like this in, in figures in painting of this period. It's really quite rare and when they do come people often talk about them as caricatures or jokes and I rather wonder about that because I, I think it's more that actually it's done so rarely that they haven't got a convention for representing a full profile as opposed to the half profile or full face which they normally find. However in this case I do have to say that with his staring eye and rather sparse pointy beard he does certainly look like a character, a character if not quite a caricature. Uh, Ina mentioned the Minai project which we're engaged in. Minai is a, uh, a modern term for overglaze enamels which were developed, invented pretty well, and developed in Kashan in the late 12th century and they provide some of the most spectacular and elaborate uh, pottery of the period. The problem is, as Arthur Lane pointed out, uh, you know, 70 years ago, that it's a technique which is very easy to fake. In other words, you can enhance minai by painting on it and putting gold on it and uh, improving its saleability, basically. And I'm afraid that an awful lot of the pieces that that scoundrel Arthur Up and Pope uh, persuaded into American collections in the 1930s have a lot of very dodgy work about them. And a piece like this, I have to say, when I first saw it at a distance, I, my heart slightly fell and I thought, oh dear, you know, we're going to have to go through, you know, one of those, it can't really be real. But actually on looking at it, 
at length and very close up, it seemed to me absolutely clear that this was absolutely real. And although quite heavily restored, the top left corner here, you can see sort of some paint, you know, modern paintwork as the piece, it has been in pieces, in fragments and put together. But the basis of it is actually extraordinarily detailed. These little figures are less than two centimeters high each in this particular bowl uh, of raised work, of uh, colored enamels, of of the detailing. The Sarahani collection has a very good group of a very wide range of kinds of minai ware and it seemed uh, a perfect opportunity and thank you Ina for taking up this opportunity so, so readily of actually finally having a real look at this work and seeing if we could find easy ways of discovering in them what is real and what is not. But certainly there's a lot of real here and it is very spectacular. This is a slightly less spectacular piece, but in, 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 in good condition. And it was looking at this closely that made me come to, a, again, a new, uh, a new realization about these wares, that there is often what seems to be a double outline and that this black, hard black pigment looks much less competently applied. And I have at times in the past thought that that is part of modern restoration process of making a worn piece look, you know, brighter for, for sale. But in fact, on looking at these pieces, there is a consistent way, and I think this represents how the pieces were made, that there is often a paler outline which is much more skillfully done. And it seems to me that this is the work of the senior artist, as it were, who outlines the piece, does the basic drawing, and it's then handed to a rather less competent craftsman who basically reinforces the outline and fills in the color, does the color again. And that this is not, this is actually how these pieces were made. It is not a, a as it were, it is not part of modern conservation. We can see that in a fragment like this, a wonderful large fragment, where the difference between the very fine underdrawing and the rather less skilled overdrawing is very clearly marked. You can see here on the, the horse's mane in particular is rather, you know, done in a humdrum fashion, whereas the drawing of the hand and of, of, of other things is of, of very high skill. And on this piece, this sharp black, which is the less skilled work, goes right to the edge of the pot, and there is no sign at all that it, it's gone over the edge, which it might well have done if it were, as it were, modern painting on an old, on an old piece. So here I'm quite certain this piece has not been touched, uh, and it shows as it were, the different stages of manufacture. And this helps to explain this wonderful bowl. I was so thrilled when I saw this in the Sarahani collection because many years ago I tried to persuade Sheikh Nasser in Kuwait to acquire it because I thought it was simply just the most wonderful bit of drawing of Kashan pottery. He didn't acquire it. I tried to persuade Kata to acquire it when I was there. They didn't acquire it but thank goodness it is here now. This is a bowl about 20 centimeters in diameter. Uh, it's signed by the potter El Mukri, who we know from several other pieces. Another bowl very like this one and three very spectacular pieces of luster painting. And it has a somewhat sort of unfinished appearance that it, though it hasn't been handed on to the colorer in uh, artisan, but just shows us the more skilled underdrawing, except perhaps in the scroll work in, in the background. And the reason for this though can be seen particularly where we see the outside of the bowl, that in fact it was intended for the whole of the background to be filled with luster. Now it's very noticeable that combination of the enamel painting and luster painting it's not that common, but it's, we found quite a number of pieces. And in almost every case, there is a problem with the luster. And I don't know quite where the technology comes, which was applied first. 
I suspect that the, it is that when the enamel painting is applied, the luster tends to evaporate off the surface. You can see that it was intended. Uh, luster painting, the luster still survives on the outside, but on the inside, you have to get it just in the right angle with the light, and you can see, as it were, the ghost. So you can see on the left there that little bird in the between those fronds, which is the ghost, the luster of the bird which we see on the right, that there would have been a complete luster background to this horse and indeed an inscription going around in a van at the top. The luster's gone, so we don't have that spectacular finish, but at least it lets us see the, the extraordinary uh, high quality painting of El Mukri uh, as he first did it. From the sublime to the ridiculous, the Mukri piece I think is one of the most beautiful things produced by the Karshan Potters. This I think probably qualifies for being one of the ugliest pots in the Sarihani collection, unless Ina has a different view. Um, but it's in the same basic technique of overglaze enamel with gilding. A particular interest though is this is the kind of piece that, that reinforces the idea that so much high class pottery is actually made in emulation of silver production. And that this with these little pierced bosses uh, and other raised work in the background is copying worked silver, worked and gilded possibly even enameled silver work. The silver simply doesn't survive as a material, it's been re, re, recycled. Uh, we only have very, very few fragments. And indeed, but so close are some of these copies, one feels you could write a history, as it were, of Islamic silver, of Iranian silver of the Islamic period, uh, through these skewer morphs in, uh, in pottery. Right. Enough, I'm getting too carried away by the medieval period. Just quickly to say that from the 15th century onwards, Chinese blue and white imports provide a lot of inspiration for uh, pottery manufacture. Here a lovely dragon bottle, copying quite closely a Chinese original. Here a copy of a Wan Li piece, which has what I always love to find is something that Arthur Lane described here, this little figure in the middle, as a drunken Chinese embracing a wine bottle and showing his legs. And he comments, this is a libelous Persian invention, uh, which wouldn't be found on the Chinese piece. But not all Safavid pottery is copies of the Chinese. There are a whole range of uh, different material which have rather been neglected, I think. Um, including interesting pieces like this, which if anything one would say has, is looking at contemporary Iznik work from the Ottoman world. The collection has a good group of tile work in which we can see the basic development of tile production, both sort of architectural tiling and internal dado panelling uh, uh, from the medieval period onwards. It's very good dragon from Tafti Suleiman. Um, this I put in in order to also to be able to pay tribute um, to our colleague who sadly uh, died recently from Covid complications in Tehran, Abdullah Guchani, whose wonderful book on the tile work of Mashhad is almost impossible to find, it's been, uh, but has an absolute wealth of material in it. And these two half tiles in the Sarihani collection are very closely allied with uh, tiles from that shrine. And from the very forceful, masterful carving of, of Timurid tile work in Samarkand to the elegant painted landscapes of Safavid, Iran. I'm going to stop there and leave you with the piece that I think of as, as it were, the mascot uh, of the collection, a piece which both in its technical excellence and its inventive uh, drawing seems to me to sum up the qualities that we find in 
uh, Iranian pottery of this period. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Oliver. That was a wonderfully enticing introduction to the book and the images were just fabulous. So we have a, a few questions, I think, um, on the... Does, does Ina have anything to say? I didn't let her in once. Oh, sorry, so yes, know. that's true. Uh, just before we say, I mean, it was, it, I think the, the point where um, uh, I think Oliver and I bonded was when he first looked at these Minais, which he's so discredited and said, that looks like it's fake. So I said, so how do we find out? And he said, acetone. So I went on and got the fiercest acetone and immediately started scrubbing away with a Brillo brush. <laughs> he was so horrified, but at least I think it convinced him about uh, our, um, our... It was a cotton pad, not a, not a Brillo pad, but... And, and, uh, and we very much look forward to developing that research project on Mina Iwe. To, it's such an, um, still such an unknown field uh, when there are objects of such fantastic quality. And the other thing I should say is that, as you would have seen going through the slide, you know, we have a love of shirts. We have lots of really, really good quality shirts. It's always the quality of the original that inspires us rather than you know, the, the kind of the, the intactness of, of what exists today. Can we go? Should we go to questions or yeah, yes? Please. Would you like to select some questions? Yes, for us? I, I, I will. I, we, there are quite a few. Um, uh, Leslie Pullen wanted to know um, what the large bowls might have been used for, the huge vessels. I think she's talking about the ones that were 50 centimeters in diameter, etc. Have you any ideas on that? Well, I think the basic idea is a lot of the, those inscriptions are inscriptions which encourage you to be a generous host. And it seems to me that they are absolutely then, as it were, conversation pieces, that they were intended to be used at gatherings where food is consumed and you consume the food, whatever might have been in them. And then you have, I mean, a very common saying on them is, you know, generosity is one of the characteristics of the people of, of paradise. Um, that it seems to be, suggest uh, that these are functional pieces, not display pieces, but that they had a, a way of then, as it were, developing conversation afterwards. Ina, do you have any? But no, I mean, I, I, I think... I think that's definitely, well, we've discussed this and we, we kind of think the same way. I love the idea that you'd get to the bottom of the dish and then discover something new, like the surprise element of, of your dining experience. And not all of them are very complimentary. And some of them are quite pious. Like we have one that talks about the Prophet Ali in it. So, you know, the, they clearly were driven by, you know, the tastes of the patron. Mm. Right, well, we, we've got another question. This is from Gregory Bellotto. He says, I had always understood that Samanid period ceramic bowls, chargers, etc., with inscriptions over a whitewashed background were attempts to imitate epigraphy on paper or parchment. Can you comment on this? Well, they are, I don't think they're imitating as it were. I think they're using the same style of calligraphy um, as you find on uh, in 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 book writing in book calligraphy, I wouldn't call it an attempt to imitate, though, because I think actually the quality of the calligraphy can be just as good as you find on the on the books. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the the aesthetic. I mean, it's clearly borrowing or or recalling an aesthetic, right? The black on white, most often, rather than anything else, but has a specific quality of its own. The other thing is the, the speed. I mean, if you think about how long it would have taken to produce a manuscript on vellum compared to even, as Oliver very well described, the, you know, the lengthy process of producing this high quality um, uh, epigraphic uh, ceramics, it would have been um, a, a kind of a more affordable <laughs> trophy um, of the same aesthetic type. Mm -hmm. Right. and. Um, well, thank you. We've also got another, another question from Gregory. Um, you mentioned that lustreware ceramics 
produced during the Abbasid period in the geographical area of modern Iran today were not examples of fine pottery. The later lusterware examples produced in Fustat under the Fatimids with copper and gold lusters were highly desired and prized objects, both for the local and export markets. In your opinion, do you consider these Fatimid examples to be representative of fine ceramic production? Well, I, I think they're both examples of fine ceramic production. I didn't mean to suggest, I mean, I use the word fine pottery simply to mean the best quality of decorated glazed pottery you find at any period. Um, I, I don't think there's a sort of cut off about where we can judge, you know, where not fine and fine uh, divide. Um, the Iraqi pieces were certainly very successful commercially because they are found exported far wider than the Fatimid wares uh, are, are ever found. Perhaps luckily because of their being made in Iraq, they're close to Basra, which was a major trading port, which would take things. But fragments of you know, uh, the Iraqi luster have been found in Southeast Asia, for instance, and you know, down Africa, as well as all the way across the Islamic world into Spain. Um, I think what I, what I was trying to point out there uh, is that I don't think the painting style is of very high quality. The potting is a very good manufacturer in those Iraqi productions, but I don't think the, lust, the painting on the Iraqi lusters is really, you know, matches uh, some of the things we've seen from Eastern Iran on, in no way near matches, you know, the best of Fatimid painting. And it's quite interesting that sometimes this discrepancy between, you know, what we would see as a skill in, in painting and the skill in potting that in, for instance, Raqqa, the pots are, contemporary with Kashan pots are often rather roughly made, but the painting can be absolutely wonderful. And the Fatimid luster wares are fairly roughly made, but again, the painting can be absolutely wonderful. You know, is, you is that not you? the question? I'm not sure. <laughs> Yes, I think that that's right. Ina, would you like to say any add to anything there, or I think I think I'd better stay out of Fatimid ceramics. <laughs> um, and Bill Kennedy wanted to know: Do any pieces depict heroic characters from the Ferdowsi's Shahnameh? Uh, yes, particularly the Kashan in Minai and occasionally in luster uh, on tile work, and there are a lot of Shanami inscriptions on tile work as well. Right. And Ada Adamova has just written an interesting article on the, the use of Shanami inscriptions on pots and tile work uh, of this period. So the interesting thing is in the Minai, where we have obviously scenes from the Shanami which predate any surviving manuscript illustration. And we have another question. Um, does, do you know anything about the training of the calligraphers um, for the pottery? Um, uh, I suppose yes. Quick answer, no, nothing. Um, and Barbara Brend has asked, um, she's very interested in the very fine underdrawings. Do you have views on the instrument that might have been used? Would it have been a fine brush, but with sufficient, sufficient resistance to run over clay, the clay surface? Oh, well, on the Minai, of course, the, it's being painted on a glazed surface, a piece that's already been fired with a shiny glazed surface. So you don't have the problem of, as it were, how stiff the brush has to be. But I, I'm pretty certain these, this is all brush painting. I can't really see how a, although it has been suggested, even for the epigraphic words, uh, Samanid epigraphic wares, that a sort of big reed pen was used. But I can't actually see how that would work on, on ceramics at all. Ina, do you want to say anything, add to anything there? No, but, but just to, to go back to the, to the calligraphy, I think, um, 
one of the things that I'm struck at is, is how important this is on many of the ceramics. But there's also that, do you know that early, well, it's not illustrated in your talk, um, the Samara ware, the Chinese shaped bowl with the three handles on it, where there is that run of what looks like calligraphy up it, but is clearly, you know, just some, you know, pseudo pseudo arab gibberish you know where someone who's illiterate is trying to borrow those aesthetics which in a way again highlights the importance of language whether it be arabic or persian to uh, uh, to the aesthetic language here oliver's got it there so in there you see a line i'm going to be quiet so he gets dominated but it's nonsense it's not calligraphy at all Right, and we have a question from David Nicole um, uh, asking if there's any evidence that um, subject matter costume was carried by migrating potters from one region or one original region, he writes, to another region. I think I would have to look, I would look for that in the Things like how, uh, although Charles Wilkinson said that the buffware from Nishapur is entirely Eastern and local designs, it looks to me as though there's quite a lot of detail, both of how figures are drawn, how horses are drawn, as well as the minor decorative detail, which comes from much further west, which comes from the yellow glaze family of Syria. Um, so I think there is definite evidence that potters moved, taking their practices with them, that it wasn't just the imitation of imported objects that caused these, these movements of styles and technologies, it was actual potters moving. So I would be not at all surprised if one found details like that being transferred. Uh, and, and then adapted as well. I mean, that's the other thing, how they adapted, you know, their their visual style to local demographics. Yes. Right, we've got uh, another question. Um, signatures of artisans and artists always acknowledge God in their work, whether at the beginning of the signature or at its end. What are your thoughts on this, please? For example, the work of the slave of God, thanking God, etc. Was it a trend? or a cultural trait? Well, I'm afraid I don't think that holds true of potter's signatures. They're quite often just the work of and the name of the potter, uh, without necessarily a particular invocation of, of God. I mean, uh, in, in the formula. So however much that holds for other materials, I don't think it is true of pottery. And we have a, 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 a Ina, would you like to say anything on that? Sorry. No. I, we have a, do you know anything about the pricing strategies for these ceramics? No, alas, that would be fascinating. It's one of the things we really don't know. You know, A, how they price, would price amongst themselves. I mean, what the difference between a you know, a cheap unglazed thing and, and the very best bottle would be. And particularly, we don't know how they would be valued in, in relation to, uh, to metalwork, for instance. Mm. Um, there's a little bit of information on uh, how much, for instance, Chinese wares were valued. I mean, not, not precise figures, unfortunately, but not until uh, you start getting precise figures much later on say in ottoman archives but at this early period we we are we 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 have no information and it's always a a bone of contention that some art historians like to call these pieces uh you know luxury ceramics and the archaeologists point out that they're found on you know sites of you know very unluxurious sites so can they be called luxury but I think the you know one is dealing with just evidence like you find pottery from Iraq for instance 
is carried somehow by overland and by sea as far as Spain. It's found in large quantities in Egypt. You find Kashan pottery carried obviously overland throughout Iran in quite large quantities. A big hoard found at Khazni, for instance, and Georgian in the northeast, which indicates that it must have been worth the transport costs and risks of carrying it in order to in order to sell it and still make a profit in far far places but unfortunately pricing strategies no just to add you know i think and and this is really where and and i wonder mujan is is still with us and she might want to comment on this but uh when you look at the um uh, first of all oliver giving the description of how these kind of very simple bowls are actually works of immense skill uh, and technical oops, Sorry, am I back? I got interrupted. Rio, <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, put it on airplane mode. I don't know why it's not working. Um, uh, but also the ingredients. You know, that when you have things like gold and methods and you know, and and these other luxury items involved in it, how amazing. You know, that that gives you a sense that these aren't you know, as has often been dismissed as sort of like lower middle class objects, but are actually objects of of sophistication and wealth as well. I don't, Mujan, are you still there? Would you like to say anything about that? Yes, we've unmuted her. Hello. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's, um, I think the complications about technology and production is not necessarily linked to materials being luxurious. Um, it might have been that you know uh, there were you know they were they they had these traditions um, and they you know they with with established links and established established uh, ways to procure materials they you know they they had established these traditions of manufacture for a long time and it's it's really difficult to link that uh, to the status of wares I think. I mean, we presumably know that some materials are more expensive than others. Certainly, yeah. That tin or cobalt or possibly other ingredients. And there's some evidence that specialist clays would be transported over quite some distances. Yeah, and we're also dealing with these few hints without any real figures. Yeah. Right. Well, we, we have one final question, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but someone's asked, what is the fruit that that splendid figure in the Kashan uh, plate that you showed us is holding? Have you any ideas on that? There's been hours and hours and hours spent uh, on this, um, you know, everything from an orange to a pomegranate. What, what, what's your best bet? I think we should just have to say, what's your best bet, Oliver? I would say it was an apricot. You had apricot. Bit big for an apricot, even though Iranian apricots can be quite big. I mean, the other thing that one that is, um, uh, any of you who get the book, um, Izzy Thomas, who's the fantastic designer for the book, has done a wonderful, uh, the actual hardcover underneath the cover flap, um, where he's had a relief of that object. Such is the veneration of that object amongst anyone who encounters it. <laughs> Right, well, I think we've come to the end of the questions that, oh, someone suggested it might be a persimmon. So there we go. Um, anyway, we've come to the, you have many, many congratulations here in the chat saying what a fantastic talk and thanking you both very, very much indeed. And um, looking forward to actually seeing the book and get, and we all are getting our hands on it. So thank you very, very much, both of you. Um, and it's, just been absolutely splendid. And I don't know if Rosalind would, would like to say anything. Uh, no, just thank you very much. It was fascinating. Yes. And I'm getting my book delivered tomorrow. All right, okay. <laughs> and are we yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Well, can I just say how great it was to see so many old friends and colleagues here, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to communicate with them individually. But